media is sponsored by My Fulfillment Team. My Fulfillment Team is a state-of-the-art inventory processing team that we see, store, prep, pack, ship, Amazon Plus, you name it, anything that you have, whether it's on Amazon or another platform, could be Walmart, your own website, they do it all. They'll bundle, they'll bag, they'll bubble. They, um, they do everything with their proprietary software. It's their own software made that works with Amazon's uh, platform. There's a specialized prep company you can trust, family owned and operated for eight plus years, millions of items processed. Never touch your inventory again, automate your process, pay for only the services you need. Again, guys, check them out at www.myfulfillmentteam.com. Hey guys, my special guest today is Jimmy Smith. I'm gonna go over Jimmy's bio and we're gonna get started here. Thanks for joining us. If you guys can hear us okay, we would like you to type a one in the chat so that we understand that you're able to hear me and you'll be able to hear Jimmy. Give me one second for that. Let me just do the intro. Okay, Jimmy Smith has been selling on Amazon since December of 2015 with his wife, Brittany. His current Amazon business is 90% arbitrage. Get that guys, 90% arbitrage. That's where I started like um, many years ago. That has 14 employees, wow, and does six figures in sales per month. Not year, per month. Mm -hmm. With very little time spent in the business and instead of they work on, they work on their bit, with very little time spent in the business, instead they work on their business. In addition to that, I thought that was a typo, <laughs> Jimmy has a course teaching his process of going from zero to 100K per month in Amazon arbitrage, does in-person coaching for arbitrage business and has a restocking software called Replen Dashboard that was designed with arbitrage sellers in mind. That's an awesome so software, guys, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, three takeaways that you guys will take away or you should take away from this webinar today is how to scale an arbitrage business how to add replenishable products to their business, and how to manage when to restock your arbitrage products. How you can use replens for wholesale leads. These are awesome things. All right, guys, again, Jimmy, thank you for taking the time out of your busy day. Obviously, you've got a lot going on being the end of the year, knowing that Amazon fourth quarter is where a lot of sellers make a lot of their money. So I appreciate you for being here. Uh, for those of my audience that don't know you, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell them first off who you are, what you did in the past, and what got you into wanting to do Amazon's and especially the arbitrage business, which we all know right now, it's a myth, but it is getting very, very saturated, but you still can make a lot of money in it, mm -hmm. and you're a living truth to that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, John, first off, for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity to to talk to your audience. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of questions there, but uh, initially what got us started in this, uh, December, 2015, um, I was selling commercial insurance to businesses. Um, and just, you know, I didn't like it. I didn't like having a job. I didn't like having a boss. I didn't like what I was doing. Um, and I've always been very entrepreneurial minded. And so I started looking for things that I could do online or from home anything that I could do to make money. Um, and I got into to Amazon. Um, we found a coaching program and we were able to, to start off with that. Um, and arbitrage seemed to be the best fit, the quickest way at the time to make money um, and to really regain the amount of money that we put into coaching. Um, and so we started with you know, scanning clearance aisles and, you know, going down, finding as many deeply discounted products as we could. Um, and that went well for a while. Um, but we ultimately hit a, a point where we couldn't grow that model as much as we wanted to anymore. And so uh, at that point, we found uh, the Amazon Legends program, um, which is a, another group, uh, Danny Stock, who you know, John, um, he runs it and taught us a little bit about replenishable products. Um, and that's what got us into this model. So within a year and a half time, we went from about $8,000 per month in sales to uh, up to $100,000 a month in sales. And we've been able to scale that and, and keep it at that level um, for the last year now. Um, so yeah, I, I just looked today before this call, we'll do over $1.2 million for this year um, with you know about 20% profit margin. So um, arbitrage is still a very good way to make money. And it's it's 
the way that we do it with replenishable products, products that you can purchase over and over again, is the only way, in my opinion, to make arbitrage the uh, more stable and something that you can count on um, from an income standpoint, um, from just a way to make your business last longer on Amazon's platform with arbitrage. So that's kind of what got us into it um, and, and our story over the last year and a half. Um, and yeah, you mentioned all the things that we do now. We have a course, you know, we train people in person and we've got a software program, um, but it's, it's, been, it's been crazy. So to say the least, to see where we've been able to come from that. So basically um, some of the questions we have, you answered a little bit is uh, when did you get started? We know it's 2015. Um, yeah. What's your story? What got you into the retail arbitrage? Why was this something that you saw as a business model that could actually get you um, to where you are today? Yeah, for me at the time, it was that it was the only thing that I could control uh, the majority of our success, right? Um, wholesale and private label, you have a lot of control as well, but um, there's a lot more variables. And so arbitrage allowed us the opportunity um, to really go out there, um, find products that we knew were selling and put them on Amazon and watch them sell. Um, yes, it's still Amazon's playground and you have to play within their rules, but for the most part, it's a very predictable model. Um, at least from my standpoint, because I don't have to deal with ads. I don't have to deal with, um, you know, is this a good niche or not? I'm just literally looking for products. Um, I utilize a software program called Keepa, um, Keepa.com, which helps us to know if things are selling profitably and consistently. Um, so I was able to see if things sell uh, enough times for us to be able to list on it. And we just find the product and we put it on Amazon. And so it was the most basic of the models to get into that also allowed um, for us to make a good amount of money um, in return for that work. I'm just anything that you mentioned as far as companies, keepa.com, K E E P A.com, right? Yep, absolutely. It's the number one software that I, if I had to get rid of everything else, I would keep Keepa. So <laughs> that's the one software program that for our business with arbitrage is the most important one. And do you use the free version or the paid version? Paid version now. Yeah, it used to be free. <laughs> so, right. um, but yeah, no, it's about $17 a month or so, depending on conversion rates since they're an international company. Um, but it's worth every penny. So someone that's starting out, do they still have the uh, free version or no? They do have a free version. You just don't get the information that you need. Uh, you can't see the sales rank drops. You can't see um, the buy box price, I don't think. They, so... In my opinion, if you're just starting out, $17 is not a bad price to pay for giving you some buying confidence. Because if I didn't have Keepa, I'd just be going based off of sales ranks, which can be deceiving. Um, and so it, you could make a lot of bad purchases. That $17 per month from Keepa will save you more money um, than that amount of cost for the subscription. So I would get it right away. And I agree. Having the right tools in your toolbox is important. You yeah. need to have those tools. Um, so doing retail arbitrage, you started out with that. What do you see different now than when you started as far as um, yeah. the retail arbitrage market? There's a lot of things that are different now. Um, so we started with clearance aisles and scanning products, scanning barcodes um, and listing them. Um, now uh, retailers like uh, brick and mortar stores are a little bit more savvy. So um, it's not as easy as it used to be in, in terms of scanning barcodes and you know being able to find a good product at a good enough price to sell on Amazon. Um, and so that has changed quite drastically. We do not scan barcodes anymore. Because if you think about it, whenever you're scanning a barcode, you're essentially telling Amazon, hey, search for this specific product. Uh, but as a buyer, if you're trying to buy a product, you're not telling, like, I'm not saying, hey, Brittany, can you go find UPC 087651? Like, I'm not telling her or asking her to go buy that specific thing. I'm asking her, hey, can you go find us some more Colgate cinnamon toothpaste or whatever it might be? Um, and, and that's what she would type in. And then you get a bunch more results than UPC. So that's a big change from our starting point is that we can now type in on the seller app 
um, keywords for products and find a bunch of different listings for that specific product, whether it's bundles or multi-packs or different sizes, um, we can really find more opportunities to list on Amazon. Um, additionally, other things have changed, right? I mean, there's more brands that are trying to submit IP claims and whatnot, um, and they're trying to get more sophisticated with their Amazon presence. Uh, we actually have, in my opinion, a lot less issues because we deal with store or products that are more, um, you know, store brands like Equate or Mainstays or from Walmart. And, you know, you have Archer Farms from Target. We deal with a lot of store brands and regional products. So regional products could be, you know, a local sauce or something like that. Um, and usually those, those products aren't getting IP claims as much. So that's how we've shifted away um, from getting those issues on Amazon. But other than that, the majority of Amazon still stays the same in that it's always changing, whether it's small rules here or there, but nothing major. Um, so those are the two biggest changes for our business and how we've operated the last four years. Um, but yeah, ultimately it's, it's still the same. So when we're talking about retail arbitrage and there's a lot of sellers doing retail arbitrage, even in the different categories and even probably with the replens and stuff like that, how do you go about doing it as as far as you're not just going out looking at, you know, rep replenishable items because anybody can do that that can sell on Amazon that's approved to do it. Mm -hmm. How do you keep your margins where they need to be? Are you bundling and multi-packing and doing things like that to keep the, um, the profit where you need it to be? Yeah. So a lot of our products are bundles and multi-packs. However, we never create listings for products. So we are going out and listing on existing listings that are on Amazon. The only things we create listings for would be some of our private label products or some of our wholesale products um, that we do have. Um, but again, 90% of our business is arbitrage. So uh, the way that we increase our, uh, you know, our purchasing price, uh, we, we increase our profit. Um, all of that is by buying products that whether it's two or three in a package or it's you know a, a toothbrush with toothpaste whatever that might be um, those listings are already out there on amazon and we just list on it um, on that existing listing and so that's what helps to keep us a little bit separated the other thing is the majority of arbitragers are lazy um, not to be mean but they are and they'll go out and they'll scan and they won't look for products um, and so we just by the fact, the simple fact of reverse searching for products by typing in keywords instead of scanning barcodes, that alone separates us from so much more competition. Um, and so that's how we protect our, our business and, and stay more profitable because of it, because it's harder for people to find those things. You can't use, um, you know, a, a software to, to scan websites um, because they're scanning based off of UPCs the majority of time. So uh, reverse searching for products is the best way to do it by actually typing in those keywords for that product. Okay. For those of the people that are on here that may not understand what you just said, explain a little bit what you mean by, I know what reverse searching is, but you're saying by typing in the keywords, give us an example of something you would type in to kind of look for a product. Right. So absolutely. What, what we typically start with, um, and just from a formula standpoint, would be uh, the brand and the type of item that it is. So let's just go with Colgate toothpaste. So if I'm in a store and I'm looking at the toothpaste aisle, I'm just going to type Colgate toothpaste and I'm going to see what comes up. And the reason I do that is because if um, you know, fresh mint is the most popular flavor, I'm just going to start with that and go find it in the aisles if they've got it. Um, and then if, if there's too many results, then I can start going product by product. So I could type in Colgate fresh mint toothpaste um, and see what pulls up because that's what's in front of me or Colgate cinnamon toothpaste and see what comes up. So we start to get a little bit more specific as we um, start doing more searches. You can even put in the ounces at the end of it because a lot of listings have the ounces and the size of that product. Um, another example is a replenishable product doesn't have to be something that people use constantly. You know, it doesn't have to be Oreos or toothpaste or toilet paper. It can be something that is actually bought over and over again by different people. So it could be, um, you know, a craftsman hammer, something like that. So um, it's not necessarily something that I'm buying multiple of throughout my life. It's something that I'm, you know, selling to multiple different people regularly. Okay. So um, we literally have products in every 
different category in a bunch of different stores because it's just stuff that sell over and over again. Um, and we use that same formula to find those products. So we start with the brand, then the type of item. If there's a size, we'll add that size. Um, sometimes I'll stand in an aisle, if I'm doing retail arbitrage, I'll stand there for four hours finding products, but usually I'm finding 30, 40 products in that one aisle um, while I'm there. And that, you know, over time, that adds up to a lot of products. Um, so we do quite a bit. Um, because of that, you know, and we have a team now that does it. So we're not actively involved looking for products. Um, but yeah, so that's how it works for us is we'll go we'll brand type of item. Sometimes we'll have the size and we'll see what pulls up and we'll make sure that the listing matches the product um, by itself. What do you do if you go in there and you type in a brand and uh, cause I know from, you know, personal experience doing this for years as well. Yeah. Um, that there's a lot of items in Walmart that are not even on Amazon. Oh yeah. So what do you do if you type something in and you don't find it on Amazon? Do you take the time to create the listing and think that you can, and test it or you just step away from that? We just step away from it. Um, so we go to the next product. Um, there are people that will create listings. I don't like to do that. Um, I also haven't outsourced that. It's just too much of a risk in my opinion because I don't know if it sells, right? So we buy things that we know are going to profit. Now it might, it's not going to be, a ton over, you know, all the time. Um, we've got products that will profit most likely 40% ROI up to 600% ROI. Um, our average ROI in our business is 70%. Um, and you know, we're doing a hundred thousand a month. That's our ROI, not our profit percentage. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we will buy products over and over, but I'm not going to create a listing because I can just move on and use that time to find another product that does sell on Amazon. So based on a certain category of product, mm -hmm. what is your threshold for how many sellers can be in a buy box before you won't put a product up there or you won't get on that listing? In other words, there's got to be a certain threshold where you're saying you make 20% off of it, but you're not going to go on a listing that has 100 sellers. Well, actually, so that's a good question. And I get I actually get that question a lot. I don't look at the number of sellers. I look at the trend. And so that's where Keepa makes a huge difference. And so, for instance, on Keepa, there's a secondary graph under more historical data that shows the seller trend. And so you can see if the sellers were at 10 sellers and went up to 100, then no, I'm not going to buy that product. But if it was at 300 sellers and has rapidly declined to 100, I would most likely get on that product because it's selling out so fast that if I send some in, it will most likely continue to sell properly. Um, I'm not going to lose money, right? So if you see a trend of it going straight up where sellers are just constantly getting onto that product, then the price will most likely drop as those sellers go up. However, if the, the sellers are dropping, the price will probably go up with it. Um, so it'll be a, a inverse relationship in that standpoint. So I don't look at number of sellers. We look at the trend of the sellers in that standpoint. So how do you, being that you've been around since 2015, and I've been around a long time, so I've kind of grandfathered into everything. <laughs> you were probably grandfathered in, but someone new is listening to this mm. and they want to know how to jump on Amazon and do replens. Right now, there's so many obstacles. I mean, you got to have invoices from manufacturers and stuff like that. What would you tell those that, for instance, wanted to go into the grocery um, part? How would you tell them to get approved on Amazon without having to spend thousands of dollars to just get approval? Yeah, so um, I think grocery now is an open category. So that's helpful for new sellers. Um, it used to be, that was actually the only category we ever paid to get an invoice create, you know, done. And like we paid a wholesaler to get that opened and now it's open for new sellers. Um, but what would I say to new sellers? We actually work with new sellers all the time. So we do have that training program that we have. Um, and you know, we have worked with friends and family that, you know, have never sold on Amazon before to do this model and we're able to find tons of products for them and with them. Um, so the biggest thing is reverse searching will be your best friend and, and typing in those keywords because you're gonna have less competition. Um, sticking with local brands or regional brands. So for instance, if you're talking about grocery, it could be barbecue sauces or you know salad dressings, whatever that might be, any kind of regional products 
are typically, you're not going to have issues with invoices on Amazon. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, lastly, looking at store brands. So whether it is Equate or Mainstays from Walmart or Archer Farms from Target, or you've got Greenbrier from Dollar Tree. I mean, there's a bunch of store brands that you can look at um, that aren't actively pursued on Amazon. So, you know, avoid the Nikes, avoid the <laughs> uh, big brands and go after some of those smaller ones that, um, uh, people don't care about as much that are on Amazon, essentially. Uh, that's my biggest tip. Now, if you are trying to get ungated in something, whether it's a brand or a category, um, it's it's really not that difficult to find a distributor, in my opinion, for it. Um, you know, if especially if it's a category, I can usually find a distributor that I can, I can buy 10 of an item um, to do that. And so that's never been an issue for us. We usually suggest for new sellers not to worry about it and just to let that happen as you go along because after about six months or so, things start to open up. Um, but if you really want a category because you have a bunch of products that you know you can sell, then it could be worth getting a distributor. Um, you know, Usually a middleman is the best way to do it, a wholesaler, a wholesaler distributor instead of a big brand um, because the distributor wants more customers, more sales, where the big brand wants to hone in on their um, you know, who's selling their product usually. Right. And I can also say from experience that, you know, I recently did a test a little, little while back of opening up another Amazon account. No, you're not supposed to, but I know how to do it. <laughs> yeah. And I did it because I wanted to learn what new sellers were up against nowadays compared to when I started when Amazon was just books. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is a huge difference because just about anything that's brand name, you got to have invoices for yeah. And I don't care if it's a toy, a grocery item. It's just the obstacles are so many in their way right now. And especially since Amazon wants you to have 10 of an item. So mm -hmm. you, you have to be able to find a way, like for instance, if you want to sell Lego and you want to sell Mattel and you want to sell uh, Fisher Price, that's someone that you can find a distributor that will carry all three so that you don't have to buy from three separate things because then the other thing that you run into is minimums. They mm -hmm. all have minimums that you got to reach to be able to buy these quantities. So you kind of want to try to bunch things together and find distributors that carry multiple. They can be small little items. Mm -hmm. um, when I did this account, in order for me to get approval in, in these things and quickly, and, eat, and I did this especially in fourth quarter, I did it because I wanted to be, um, I wanted to be able to merchant fulfill in fourth quarter and you had to reach 25. Well, I just went out and bought 25 things that were small little items that I didn't care if I made money on. I just wanted to get my 25 in and yep. I was willing to take that loss. So this business does have its, you know, downfalls a little bit too, if you're willing to do it, but it has a tremendous up for as well, because yep. you can go in and expect to lose a little bit of money to get approved in these things. But the long part, the long process of it, you're going to benefit it tremendously. Right. Yeah. No. And I, I agree with that uh, from a standpoint too, with brands, they do have a lot of brand restrictions. Categories are easier in my opinion to get unrestricted in because there's so many different products that could fall under that to get unrestricted from a distributor. Um, if you're looking at brands like Lego and Mattel and all of those, then yeah, that's going to be a, a different road. Um, with replens in our model, we don't care as much about it. We actually don't sell much Lego and I'm sure we're missing out on a bunch of money because of it. Um, but we focus on really the slow and steady growth of products that don't care if they're on Amazon or not. And so for new sellers, it's easier in my opinion to find products that are non-branded, really non-brand driven that are regional products or store branded products that don't care about Amazon presence. So, uh, but Lego, if you want to go for those types of things, then yeah, you're going to need to find a distributor, like John said, that has multiple brands that you can purchase from. And you talked about regional and regional is interesting to me, but as far as regional, you also said that you jump on people's listings. Regional is not out there everywhere. So finding regional items can be a task as well as trying to jump on a listing that already exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, technically there are a lot of listings out there already for regional products. Now there also is a big opportunity to create new listings for regional products. That's something we don't do, but it's a great, a great way to, to kind of get started in creating listings is to look for regional products that, you know, if I, if I live, you know, I live in St. Louis now, if I were to move to California, 
I, you can bet that I'd be going to Amazon to try and find the product that I used to love eating in St. Louis that I can't find anymore, you know, um, or maybe it's some other type of branded or um, regional product or local product. There are local stores out there that are more niche driven that I think are a huge opportunity for sellers to, to go shop arbitrage um, at those stores because those local stores will have products and brands that are harder to find in big stores like Walmart or Target. You know, they're not going to carry some of those niche products that some of the local stores do. So, um, you know, that, that's usually where I push newer sellers that want to do this model um, into starting is with regional and local stores. Yeah, absolutely. And you hit on the key right there, um, right on the head is that with regional products, you could lived in you could have lived in Florida, and all of a sudden you moved to you know like California, and you can't get that product anymore, and you yeah. loved it as a kid, and now all of a sudden you find it on Amazon, and you got a supply of it again. Yeah, that works great for that. But I think a lot of sellers don't realize too is like certain times of the year are very crucial as well. Like you can live in New Hampshire, and you get to November, and you're not selling swimming stuff, but you yeah. might be still selling swimming stuff out in California. Mm -hmm. because it's also about timings of the year people think because one area is not going to be buying the product anymore that that product is done and that's not necessarily the case because where one area could be in winter the other area is not there yet and your products could still sell yeah absolutely um yeah and and i mean you can have it uh, that's that's a lot for clothes but you can also have it to where um you know people are snowed in too so they're willing to buy products off of amazon that are going to get delivered to their door or, if, or even if they live in new york city and they've got it uh, in a walmart near them but it's hard to get to a store in new york city because you got to drive or in la you got to drive so people are willing to pay more on amazon for things even if they do have access to it um so keep that in mind it's not always that it has to be regional or local. It's just, uh, it gives you more insulated protection on your business. So yeah, it's convenience. People yeah. buy on convenience. Now they just don't have time to be going to stores a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So you say you have a team and I'm, I'm, I'm totally impressed that you have a team. The biggest question that I get on my show sometimes and people ask me is how do I trust somebody to go out and spend my money? you're sending somebody out to go do this. Are you using gift cards and putting limits on them? Or how are you saying, Hey, I need you to go out and pick up this and giving these people hundreds of dollars and trusting it. Yeah, that's difficult. Um, you know, at first we hired friends and family, so that was easy. Um, but we actually did recently expand with six new people. It was seven. We had to let somebody go. Um, but we expanded with now six new people that we didn't know personally. They were just in the area essentially and responded to our, our um, ad for a job. And so what we do now is we had to set up some internal controls. So we've got a couple different things. Uh, one is our, uh, our time clock. Um, app that we use. Uh, it also records GPS locations of when they arrived at a place and when they left a place. So that way we know how long they were actually in the store, that they weren't, you know, like getting lunch somewhere uh, and again, charging us for it. So we've got that to set it up. And then second from your question, how do we, uh, you know, make sure from a money standpoint, we don't use gift cards. We use, it's a different service um, that uh, it's called Bento for Business, B-E-N-T-O. And essentially they're uh, debit cards that you can set spending limits. And you can also set, set a limit on that card to where they can spend the money. So there should, shouldn't be any issues. Um, additionally, if they were to just buy a TV at like Walmart or something for 2000 bucks, um, there, there is still protection on those cards um, to essentially fraud protection that we could protect our money um, from that standpoint. So we use Bento for business for that. There are other services out there that I looked into that I didn't like um, their customer service, et cetera, but Bento has always been great to us. Um, and yeah, it works great. They also have to take a picture of the receipt after they purchase products. So we can check that. Um, we've got a bunch of smaller internal controls uh, to make sure that we're not, you know, just getting ripped off. Um, and yeah, so that, that's the majority of, of how we control it. There's still some risk, but we tried to make it as minimal uh, amount of risk as possible. Another big question I get is, uh, how do you pay them? What do they make? 
Yeah, uh, we actually pay hourly. So we don't, we've got one or two people that know how to actually source products, like actually find new ones. But the majority of our, our people um, are just shopping off of a list. And so we pay them hourly, um, right? We started at $11 an hour for training and moved them to $12 an hour after 30 days once they were fully trained. Um, and so that's what we pay them currently. And do they pay their own expenses? That's another thing. So what we do is we they, pay, in other words, I don't mean to interrupt you, but are they like contractors where you don't worry about the, um, any of the uh, insurance and liability type no. stuff? No, they are employees for us. And so the reason we did a lot of research on like what constitutes an employee um, and we just felt safer putting them as an employee um, just because we were giving them all of the tools they needed to do the job. They didn't bring anything <laughs> uh, along with them. And so we felt like we had to make them an employee. And so what we do is we pay for their drive time. So whenever they leave their house, we pay from that drive to the store when they're at their store, then from the drive to the warehouse and back to their own home. Um, so that's how we, you know, we aren't paying for their gas or their mileage, but we pay for their time while they're in their vehicle. So they're on the clock from the time they leave your place till the time they get back. Yep, exactly. Um, and we can track it with the GPS. So we know if they um, spend way too much time driving and they're just essentially driving to other places, we can, we can tell. And so we've got different metrics that we were able to create from our own business and how much they should be purchasing per hour and all of this that we, we judge them based off of. If it goes under a little bit, then there's some training and some questions we can ask. But if it goes way under, then they're most likely ripping, ripping you off. Um, and so we were able to, <laughs> to just judge their performance based off that. I'm going to just go through some questions real quick here. Tracy yeah. says, Jimmy, do you do many grocery items as replens? Uh, Tracy, that's a great question. We do. Um, we do a, d a bunch of different categories. About 25% is grocery, I believe. Um, and that's usually what I tell most people. It we're about 20 to 30. So I just average it at 25. And then he had another, another question that you kind of went over already. Do you create your own listings? You kind of said you, do, you don't do that. You mostly just do the replens and go off of other people's listings. Um, right. Another question he has is, this is a great question. Do you have much success with online arbitrage for replens? Yeah, um, so absolutely. It's a, it's a little bit of a different play uh, with the same model, the same way you type in products and search for them. Um, we actually do about... 30 to 35 percent of our business is online um, and so yeah we do really well with online arbitrage it's just a little bit different in the sense that more people can find those products um, because they're all online and they can get shipped to you um, so we like the retail model the best because it's a little bit harder and, and gives us more protection um, but yes we absolutely do online arbitrage and i know somebody that does only online arbitrage and does very well um, with with the replens business another question from zig ziglar i wonder if that's the writer yeah right <laughs> <laughs> i love your books if that's you <laughs> yeah right <laughs> do you pay do you pay their auto expenses their auto expenses no we just pay for their drive time and so um yeah because they're an employee we we haven't had to do that nobody's asked and they don't drive that much i mean the stores really aren't that far away <laughs> so Tracy says, how do you handle and manage expiration dates of grocery items sent to FBA? That's a great question. Guys, keep the questions coming. Jimmy loves this stuff. I do. Yeah. Question, Q and A is my favorite actually, um, because then I can help you guys more. Um, but yeah, so expiration dates, that's a great question um, because a lot of people ask me that too. So what we do is we try to make sure to buy at least six months out um, because Amazon, you can send it in with about, I think it's four months left, 120 days or something like that. And then they'll send it back to you after, if there's 90 days on the expiration. So we buy with six months usually. Um, and then because we are purchasing products based off of Keepa, um, we are trying to buy to sell them within a 30 day period. So if they go a little bit over 30 days or, you know, if they're 60 days and they sit longer than we thought, then we'll be perfectly fine with the expiration dates. We very, very rarely have issues um, with an expiration date and the product having to come back. So um, that's what we do. We just have to manage it properly. There's no real way to manage expiration dates um, from Amazon or Inventory Lab or anything. Um, so we just try to buy smart um, whenever there's something with an expiration date. 
And you keep mentioning Keeper all the time, and I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here. I don't know if you prepared for this or not, but do you have a screenshot of Keeper and just to kind of give people an idea of what that is and what it does for you? Um, I don't have a screenshot. I can get it. Let me see if it'll open. Live webinars, people. You can put them on the spot. Because <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm not sure everybody knows what Keeper is, and you keep mentioning it. I know what Keeper is, and it's a very handy tool, and it does a lot of research for you. And you can kind of give you a lot of data. Let's try like um, yeah, okay. Okay, guys. Well, he. What physically happens to products once they are purchased? Terry says. What physically happens to products once they are purchased? Um, talking about prepping. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. So there's a lot that can go into it depending on the, the product. Um, you know, you're going to have to either poly bag it or bubble wrap it. But the, the gist of it is you prep it the way Amazon needs you to prep it. And so um, they will give you the guidelines for what's needed. Um, we use inventory lab for all of our shipments. And so they'll tell you what if it needs poly bagging or bubble wrapping. Um, and then you have to put, we uh, put our own labels on it. And so um, it'll print out what's called an FN SKU sticker. And so we print that out, we put it on the product, and then we um, pack it into the different shipments that Amazon tells us to, to send it in. And we send it to Amazon, and then they will distribute it based off of orders and, and products um, that are ordered. So, yeah. While you're getting up that keep a gaff, do you, got graph, do you, um, do you have a team that does this as well? Oh yeah. Yeah. So half of our employees, for the, I believe it's at, well, no, I think it's only five, um, half of or five of them. Sorry. Our prep and ship, um, employees. Okay. And so Jamie, he's Jamie says he's late to the game. Let me grab that again while you're doing that real quick. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen before we get into that. Jamie yeah. says, hi, I'm late to the show. So sorry. If already asked, how do you get ungated to sell in grocery? new to these terms. So we did go over that a little bit, Jamie, but if he wants to just give a brief overview of that, or you can catch the replay of this, it will be up at some point. So yeah, I can go over it. Um, uh, it's pretty simple. I mean, if you're a brand new seller, it, sh it should be open. So a lot of new sellers I've talked to recently can sell on grocery. It used to be gated. So if you have like a, an account that's a couple years old, it might still be gated if you never opened up. So if you are gated, then you can find a distributor. You can just type in grocery distributor um, in your area or just whatever, and then open an account with your, uh, you need to have a resale license. So like a, an FEIN and an actual business. Once you give them that information, they can open up their uh, products to you and you can just purchase 10 of one item uh, to send it to Amazon, send the invoice to Amazon and they will open up the category for you. Um, but it has to be 10 of one item. Even if you lose money or break even on it, it it's worth it to do that because then you can um, start selling a bunch of products in Amazon. So, um, so yeah, should I go over Keepa now? Yeah, guys. So Jimmy's got, what he's got up here is the Keepa chart. And this is very critical to kind of give you a overflow of how Keepa works. For those of you that have never used Keepa before, this could be a really great lesson for you to get inside Jimmy's head a little bit and see what he looks at and how he makes his decisions with Keepa. Yeah, absolutely. So I just pulled up a random product um, on here. It's actually something I don't even sell, um, but I wanted to show you how it works. So it usually pulls up a three month chart. And if you can, um, I always click on the year. Um, so that, that way I can see it all. And you can see that um, there's a couple different things that I look at right away. Uh, one is this green line. So it's the sales rank line. If you see this, it shows its sales rank. And so every time that that product drops, I consider that to be a sale, whether it's one sale or multiple, I'm not sure, but I count that as at least one sale. Um, and so that's important because if you're seeing drops, then you know it's selling regularly. You can see that it sold a lot more regularly back in January of last year, um, but it was selling. And so the second thing I look at are the buy box, these pink dots here to see if that price is consistent as well. So um, it doesn't really give you a good indication whenever I click that. Um, but you can see just the pink dots, not necessarily the orange ones, because the buy box is what is being shown to the customers um, on Amazon whenever they're looking to purchase this product. 
And so if that, if that price is stable and it's a profitable price point for you, then we will most likely test that product by purchasing, you know, two to four of an item and then sending it in to see if it sells at that price point and making sure that it's, you know, actually going to stay there. We don't go crazy deep. We're not buying a hundred of these things. We test two to six at a time. Um, as we got bigger, we started to test, you know, four to eight, but starting out newer, you want to test two to four most likely. Um, and then the last thing I look at is this bottom graph. So if you click, um, more historical data, it'll open this thing up. And then you just have new offer count shown. None of these other things need to be shown. And the new offer count is the amount of sellers. And they add together merchant fulfilled sellers and FBA sellers. And so what this does is you can see that sometimes it goes down and up, but if it's going down regularly, then that's good because that means that sellers are selling out of their product. At least that's what I take it to, to mean. Um, if it's going up quite a bit, then more sellers are coming onto a listing than are actually selling out of products. And so if I were to have come on the listing at this point, I would probably avoid buying this because it's sold once or twice in this period and the sellers have consistently gone up. But if I look at the whole year, it's gone down. Um, the sellers have gone down, meaning it's sold a lot and they've gone back up, but then they started to go back down again. So we look for movement in this box and then also movement of this green line. And then lastly, the pink dots to stay fairly consistent throughout the year. It doesn't fluctuate a ton. Um, and if I look at the 1500 days, you can see a lot more information. So like here, whenever we were talking earlier, John, about the, uh, the amount of sellers, if I were to come on the listing here, I wouldn't have bought that product because a bunch of sellers came on. Um, but if I'm to look at the last year, the sellers come on and off, so they're selling regularly and we would, we would test that product. Does that help? Does that make sense? Is there anything I need to clarify on it? You guys get that or you need any more information on that? If you guys have any questions on that, please put it in the chat so he can uh, address those for you. Yeah. All right, we do have a question, not on that, but we do have another question that says, uh, do you print expiration dates on separate labels for each grocery item? And that uh, is sent into FBA, or is that something that Inventory Lab can handle? Can you talk about the statistic button on bottom of Keepa Graph? That you can answer that as part two. Okay, so part one, the expiration dates. Um, we the way that you can do that with Inventory Lab, the expiration dates is by clicking. There's like a settings for your print settings that you can click to add the expiration dates on the. Um, the FN SKU label and it'll automatically print from inventory lab as long as you put that information in whenever you're adding the product. So it needs to know what the expiration date is, but it'll print it out for you. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, and if you're not using inventory lab, then you would need some sort of system to write down the expiration dates or you'd have to print out a separate label or something. Um, so hopefully that answers that. And then for the statistics button, um, the main thing that I look here it, or look at here is that far right one that says sales rank. You can see drops. It says 2.3 per, per month. Um, and that tells you that it sells about two to three times a month. Um, but that's been recently. Um, and so that's when we would probably test two of them just to see how they, they go. Um, because most likely if you stay competitive at this price point here, the $8 and 61 cents, um, you're going to sell the product and hopefully you're buying it at a profitable price point. So you know that you're going to be able to sell that within a 30 day period. And if you sell two in, in a week, then go out and buy four and see how that goes. Um, you know, it's, it's all testing. Um, but at least you have some um, assurance that the product sells, the price stays fairly stable um, and you know that you can list on it and it will sell out at some point. And really, the worst that happens if you're buying this at a profitable price is that you're going to break even most likely. You most likely won't lose much money. I mean, 80% of the time, if you're making money, that's great. 10% of the time, you're probably gonna break even and then another 10%, you might lose a little bit, but not a bunch. So if you were to tell anybody in the stock market that, hey, these are your odds, they would go crazy, right? I mean, this is a great, <laughs> great way to make sure that you can get a good return on your investment um, and that you can make money doing this uh, profitably and you know that this is something that is stable, right? And um, you have some assurance that it's gonna sell and you're gonna make money. All right, that's a great question. Um, 
what struggles did you have along the way? We all have struggles. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so here, should I uh, turn off my screen? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thanks for uh, doing that. Yeah, no problem. So some struggles that we had along the way. Um, our biggest one was, was learning how to scale, um, scale this model. Because at first I quit my job. We didn't want to hire any employees. I quit my job. We were doing, you know, 50% of what we needed to make. So we figured I could quit and we would double that, no problem. But the, the bottleneck for us was shipping and prepping and we hated doing that. So we bought a bunch of products, but then, you know, we didn't want to ship it out. <laughs> so that was our biggest struggle is, okay, well now we need to find people to prep and ship. Um, and so we were able to, um, you know, go ahead and, and do that. Um, so that took us a little bit. Other than that, it was, you know, dealing with little things along the way, whether it's Amazon, you know, rule changes, or it was um, needing to change our model from clearance to uh, replen products, whatever that might be. I mean, they were all so small. They weren't huge issues. Um, the biggest ones were scaling and learning how to build a team and building out our systems for this model. Yeah, and you hit it on the head there too, because um, anybody that's doing retail arbitrage out there understands that there's a lot. It's not just about the buying. It's the prepping and everything else that goes along with it. That's where your time consuming comes in. And there's two ways you can do that. You can do like what Jimmy did is create a team and have a team working for him inside his own operation, or you can source it out to fulfillment centers. However, I caution you when you're doing replen replenishable type items or retail arbitrage, make sure your margins are there so that you can afford to pay someone to actually prep it for you. Mm -hmm. Once you're able to do that and you can scale it, that's when you're able to grow tremendously because now you have a team working for you, whether it be your own team or a fulfillment center, and you will grow astronomically real quick once you're able to do that part. Yep, absolutely. All right. How did you manage and do you currently manage a thousand different arbitrage products? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so uh, we do have over a thousand active SKUs at Amazon, um, and we hit a hundred thousand per month once we were at eight hundred active SKUs. And we've gone through thousands of different replen products, but uh, we started with a spreadsheet, and we would manually just you know adjust that every week or so. Um, then we started to add in different. Uh, you know, different reports from Amazon that showed us our sales and you know, a bunch of different information. So we were able to get that created. And then we actually recently, myself and another large seller, his name's Carl Jacoby. He does about a hundred thousand a month as well in arbitrage um, and replens. And so we created a software it's called replen dashboard. And I think we actually got a code for you, John, um, for your listeners um, for 10% off. Um, but it's called replendashboard.com and it gives you all of the information that you need for this model. And it works well for wholesale as well um, in terms of sales the last 30 days, your competitor prices, your profit. Um, it gives you a bunch of information. And um, yeah, I think the code for your people was pro seller 10. Yeah, I got it. I'm going to post it right now. Cool. Yeah, it's pro seller 10. You get 10% off forever. Um, there is also a yearly option too. So you get two free months and 10% off of that if you want it. But um, it's a 30 day free trial. So, you know, for anybody on here, yeah, go for it. Um, give us suggestions for things that you want changed. We're always adding new features to it. Um, but yeah, we, we tried to make it with arbitrage sellers in mind because there's a bunch of restocking software programs out there that are for more private label sellers, some for wholesale. Uh, but nothing really for arbitrage and wholesale specifically. Um, and so that's what we, we created that. And it saves us tons of time, probably um, by tons. I mean, it saves an employee one full day of time, eight to 10 hours. So um, that's a lot of time each week that we are saving because of it. So that's how we manage those products now um, is with that software. And if you don't, you know, if you're brand new, then you can start with an Excel sheet and kind of keep track of that. You can download reports from Amazon to see your sales by product. Um, I think the restock inventory report is one um, that we used to use an inventory health report was another one. So you can use those to, to figure out what you need to restock. We have another question from our friend Zig Ziglar. <laughs> Are you selling on other platforms besides Amazon? Um, we do actually. So we sell on, um, we've got some private label products that we put on other platforms. So Etsy, we were approved to sell on Walmart and eBay and, you know, obviously eBay. So um, those are the only other ones that we look at, but we don't do any arbitrage on other platforms. We've thought about Walmart, but there's a lot of 
different systems we'd have to put in place and different processes. Um, but you know, we're actively looking at it in 2020 to see if we can expand uh, our arbitrage model to other platforms. From our Facebook community, Jamie asked, first of all, he says, thank you, Jimmy, for the easy understanding step process. Much appreciated. He yeah. says, can we do the Merchant Fulfilled too, or do we need to do it FBA? Uh, you can do Merchant Fulfilled. Um, Amazon is actually making that easier um, every year for Merchant Fulfilled sellers to compete properly with FBA. Um, however, I think FBA is the best way to go because so many people have prime memberships that they just want two-day shipping and they'll pay more money for it. So um, once you sell more than 40 items a month, you're making more money doing it FBA and it's easier in my opinion. I, I always tell new sellers, if you're serious about it, then just do FBA and get into it the right way. Um, you know, if, if you're just trying to see if it works, then yeah, you can list Merchant Fulfilled. It's going to be a little bit more difficult uh, because of different fees and shipping and all of that, in my opinion. So, but yes, you can. Here's another great question from uh, Facebook. What question do you ask the grocery distributor to ensure you can sell their products on Amazon? Um, well, I actually don't ask unless they ask me if I sell on Amazon, <laughs> um, because usually if they care, they'll ask you if you sell on Amazon. If they don't care, then you can just order products and sell it, and you'll have an invoice that Amazon would require to prove that you're, you know, that you bought it from a legitimate source. So I don't ask um, or talk about it unless they ask me. We have another question that says. Was having enough cash to scale and build inventory a problem for you? If so, how did you overcome it, especially for Q4? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so we were selling for about, let's see, two years, two years and a few months before we scaled and, and brought on employees. So we had enough capital to do that. Um, starting out, we started with like 500 bucks. Um, for inventory and then we just put everything back into the business because I had a full-time job and so we were able to grow our capital that way. Um, so that's what we did. So it was never a huge issue because we did it slowly um, and we were also able to put all of the money back into the business. Tracy asked, how much is the software per month? Uh, it depends on how many SKUs you have. So if you go to replendashboard.com, it'll show you all three different plans. Uh, if you have, you know, I think it's less than 400 active SKUs. Um, and we actually look at the active ones, not, not the inactive ones. Like if you sell, used to sell a bunch of books, we don't care. We just care about what's actively going to be on our dashboard. Um, I think it's about, I think it starts at twenty nine ninety eight per month. Um, and once you're, you're from 400 to 1,000 active, I think it's forty nine ninety eight per month. And once you're over a thousand, it's seventy nine ninety eight per month, um, and you can get two months for free if you purchase a year, um, and you get the first thirty days for free anyway. Um, and with John, you pro seller ten, you get ten percent off. So uh, every month. Uh, Janie asked, "Was what, what was the name of the software again?" Replendashboard.com. So R E P L E N dashboard d a s h b o a r d dot com. You can actually, if you can get to the chat, you can type that in there too, to all the panelists. Yeah. I mean, all to the attendees. Yeah. They can see it. All right, guys. Great questions. Oh. All right. Let me see what I got here for questions. Uh, let's see. I like this one because they, they always want to know what we're up to next. What are <laughs> your future goals? That's a great question. I actually did a webinar in a Facebook group that I have with my course um, about goals. And so um, we're big on goals um, and more on forming kind of what we want to be. Um, you know, like I want to be a successful Amazon seller. And so how, what are the actions I need to take to do that? So our goals in 2020 in terms of that, um, we want to hit $2 million per year in sales with arbitrage. That, that seems pretty uh, doable from where we're at. Um, we want to grow our private label brands um, more because we now have more time to do that as well. Um, you know, I want to have uh, you know, a certain level for our software program in terms of subscribers. So we're looking at different ways to market and advertise for that in the future. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot of different goals. Our biggest things probably right now are growing our arbitrage business and getting you know, even questions offloaded to somebody else. So that way we're completely hands off and then 
growing our private label brands. Those are our two big ones for Amazon. Um, but yeah, so I'll give you a tip too for goals. Um, I always liked this from a leading goals versus lagging goals. Um, and so a lagging goal would be the result. So that's, I wanna hit $2 million in sales. But a leading goal is what leads you to that result. And so to hit $2 million in sales, what actions do I need to take to get there? So for us, it would be how many replens, new replens do I need to find um, to get there? So if you're just brand new, and let's say, because uh, 2 million sounds ridiculous, right? If you're new, uh, I want to hit $1,000 per month in sales, and that's your goal. Well, what is your leading point to get there? So maybe that is finding um, 50 new replens um, in a month to get to your thousand dollars of sales. Cause you can actively work towards that goal. You can go out, put your time in and find 50 replens or 50 products that you can sell. That's not difficult. And you can continue to break it down by week or day if you need to do that. Um, so whenever you're setting goals, make sure it is an action step, a leading goal that leads to your lagging goal of a result, whether it's I want to lose 50 pounds or I want to, uh, you know, sell $10,000 a month on Amazon. That is the lagging goal. You need to work, focus on the leading part of that. Yes. And I just typed in there for you guys, if you haven't seen it, um, basically, what is your plan of action? Mm -hmm. you know, how are you going to get to that uh, goal that you're looking at? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can break it down. Like, you know, I tell people all the time, if you want to buy a brand new car and a car costs $30,000, how many items do you got to sell prop and profit from in a month to be able to buy that car if you want to buy it in a month? Absolutely. And you could do it and try to do it with one product, but imagine if you had 50 products and they were all selling five to 10 items, you know, either a day and then do the math and see, does that get me to buy that new car I want? Or does that get me to put on a down payment on a house that I want? You have to have something before you to reach what your goal is. If you just have the goal, like what uh, Jimmy's talking about, I want a brand new car in 2020. Well, that's great. We, we want that, but how are we going to get to that? What are, the, what are the, um, the plan of action we have to get there? And you can break it down into simple terms as much as I need to sell 15 different items, five of these items every day. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it can be broken down. And when you put it on paper in front of you, which I call your vision board, when you have that vision board and you can see it in front of you, you can achieve it, but you got to have it. You can't just think it. It's got to be seeable before yeah. it's doable. I love that term. It's got to be seeable before it's doable. Mm -hmm. Remember Absolutely. that. No, that's a good point. And just for people on this call, our average numbers, by the way, so if you're trying to work backwards for replens, uh, we have a $15 average selling price. Okay. Um, we have we average 10 sales per month per item. And so that could be two per month of one item and that could be 30 a month of another, but we average 10. So those are the two numbers. If you want to hit, you know, $10,000 a month in sales, you can use those numbers to figure out how many items you need to find um, and how many replens you need to get there. Absolutely. Um, Jamie asks, do you have, let's see, wait a minute. It just, it just flipped on me real quick. <laughs> um, so do you have like certain distributors to start off with perhaps two? So I guess he's asking, maybe you can give him a couple of names of distributors that might be someone he can look into. Um, well, since we do mainly arbitrage, we don't use distributors. We use um, stores, right? So uh, the biggest one a lot of people like to start off with is Walmart and Target. Uh, but we typically like to suggest regional stores, whether it's a grocery store like Kroger, um, something like that. I, depending on where you live, that could be anything, right? Um, it could even be a regional farm and home store. Those, those types of stores have a lot of niche products that uh, big retailers don't have. So um, that's the only kind of lead and direction I can give you because we like to focus on regional stores. Depending on where you live, you're going to have different stores to go to. Um, and then if you're looking for distributors for wholesale, it just depends on the products that you want to sell. Um, and just looking for that brand and, and finding a distributor for it. Um, sometimes it's harder than others, depending on the brand, but uh, just a simple Google search can help. And somebody said something about, let's see, I'm trying to go through here. Oh, 
Tracy asked about this. I don't know, Tracy, um, I am also doing my consultant starting in 2020. So I just want to put that out there for you guys too. So if anybody's looking for anyone to consult with as far as their business plan and things like that, I will be taking that on in 2020. I want to help as many people as I can. Um, but however, to answer your question, he said, you talk privately about private coaching you touched on briefly on. Can you ask, can you also talk about the cost of private coaching? Yeah. So, um, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, I can just give you the website. Is that okay, John? If I could just give them the website to go yeah, to absolutely. Okay. Um, the website for the private coaching is proven replend Um, and it's strictly what we do and I'll type it in the chat. Um, proven replend training. Dot com. Uh, what we do is we come out to you for two days. Uh, we shop with you one full day and then we do prep and ship the second day. So we are face to face with you. It's not a group of people. It is you and your business partner, or whomever you want to have. Um, but yeah. And so the cost, it varies depending on if you want uh, myself and Brittany to come out there. It depends on where you live. So there's a lot of things because if the travel is farther, it's going to be more expensive than if it's, you know, and 30 minutes away from us. So uh, if you just go there, it'll show you all of the details of the things that you get. Um, and yeah, you can just fill out a form and apply from, from that standpoint. Yeah. And uh, like uh, Jimmy said too, when it comes to like my consulting or his uh, coaching, it, I think it's going to be more of a case by case because some people need more of things than others. It's just a matter of getting with us, contacting us and, um, letting us uh, have a talk with you if you're interested yeah. and see where we feel that you can use help in what area and then go from there and find out, you know, what the plan of action should be and whether or not it's a good fit for Jimmy or for what I'm doing. Yeah. But it's, it's never, I, I don't think it could ever be a flat anything because it really depends on, you know, the situation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and ours is directly, strictly for replen sellers, right? If you want to learn replens, that's the where place to go. If you want to learn private label and wholesale and do a whole bunch of stuff, then no, don't, don't do our program. Um, because that's, I mean, we can talk about it, but I'm not going to say that I can coach you perfectly on it because those are things still learning where John, you know, can have, he can do a lot more, um, in terms of what you need. So, um, we are strictly focused on the niche of replen arbitrage and replen arbitrage is what I <laughs> strictly replen products so yeah especially wholesale i've got over 30 years wholesale experience yeah. so again right. it's something i'm going to be taking on new in 2000 in 2020 that i haven't done i've had a lot of people ask me about doing some uh, coaching i don't consider it coaching i consider it consulting because hmm. i feel like i'm an advocate working with you not just coaching you and i think consulting is just for me it's a better term so yeah that's kind of what i want to do yeah. Listen, guys, we had a lot of great questions here. I don't see any more questions. Let me look real quickly. I don't want to forget anybody. Let me see. Uh, okay, this is a really great question cool. uh, from Jamie. It says, on doing FBA, do you have to collect sales tax on your sales? And if so, what do you use? That's a great question. Um, First off, I'm going to preface this with talk to an accountant, um, as everyone probably does. Um, we do collect sales tax. Um, and so because of the level that we got to, for the longest time, we didn't. We just did it in our home state of Missouri. Laws changed about a year ago, and we grew around the same time. So we started to use tax jar to help us do that. Um, and so there's tax jar. There's also Avalara. Who, it's just another software program. We just like the simplicity of tax jar. Um, our accountant recommended that. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we use to collect sales tax from people purchasing from us. And then we remit it to each state we're required to do so. So there's a bunch of states. Amazon does it for you, which is awesome. I think eventually Amazon will for every state. Um, but right now, um, you know, there are still some states that Amazon doesn't collect for you. And so we do collect in those states and remit them to the states as, as we need to. Yeah. And if I was to say anything on that, uh, subject i think by the end of 2020 amazon will be collected for every state yep i just think it's going that way where it's just going to happen where they just do it yep they, they've kind of tried to back out of it as long as they could but now they're seeing that um there's no way out and that it just makes sense and it would create one heck of a mess for them if mm. they kind of see because it makes it interesting because if you think about it sometimes when you send product like 
let's say you're sending your product to a, a Texas uh, FBA center, but that's what you sent it. <laughs> but what happens if Amazon now sends it to over to California, which collects, you know, collects the sales tax and it's higher or, I mean, it, you sent it to Texas, but you're responsible for wherever it ends up and you get taxed for, it'd be a nightmare for them. And exactly. then you go to California and there's 27 different zip codes and they all have different tax. I mean, it would just be a nightmare. So it, it's going to come to the point where Amazon's just going to have to bite the bullet and do it. it it's yep. going to be less of a headache for them. Absolutely. And, and it's become so commonplace with a lot of states now that they have, you know, created the lawsuit to get Amazon to do it, that now every other state has a path to make Amazon to it. And I think that uh, that'll happen more and more over the next year. So last but least, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, Jimmy, how do they contact you? You can put that in the chat first. I'd appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, really, I'd, I don't have a, uh, a place to get a hold of me unless uh, you're on Facebook. You can find me there. Um, you can, you know, find me through Replen Dashboard. You know, you can go to support at replendashboard.com if you need something. And um, we do have um, assistant, virtual assistants that monitor that. So if there's anything you need, you can do that. Um, and guys, if you're looking, if you're new and you're just starting out and you want to get into Amazon, mm -hmm. we all tell you arbitrage is the easiest point of entry. It always has been and it always probably will be. Yep. Yes, there are obstacles in place now that there weren't before, but it is still the easiest, less costly, less risky way of doing it than trying to go and do it through wholesale or private label. I have moved on, you know, into wholesale and private label type stuff and, you know, in doing those type of things. But Starting out, you got to get your feet wet if you want to sell on Amazon. And the best way to get your feet wet is through retail arbitrage and online arbitrage. And if you want to really get your feet wet and learn the process, get with Jimmy, get to his course. This gentleman knows his stuff. I mean, he's doing 100000 a month, guys. 100000 a month. I can tell you he has a team in place, but I can tell you whether he's got a team or not, he's pushing some product of retail <laughs> arbitrage. On a 20% profit margin, he's pushing some serious products. So, guys, he knows his stuff. He knows what he's doing. Get his course. Get with him. Talk to him. Uh, pick his brain and learn from him because he's the guy. That's why he's here today, because of what he's doing and how successful he's been since 2015. So my suggestion to you, if you're here and you're hearing this for the first time and you want to do Amazon selling and you want to learn the ins and outs, learn it from someone that's doing the retail arbitrage um, way because it's the easiest point of entry. And from there you grow it out and you grow it to other marketplaces and you do what you need to do. But as always guys, thank you for spending the end of the year, a little time with us here on our show. Um, this is our 113th show. We are so proud to be able to bring these type of shows to you. Our goals for 2020 bring you more quality guests that are doing this, that are making it happen, that are changing lives, that are changing their own lives, changing other people's lives, and just willing to share, share what they know. Knowledge is power, and they're willing to come on my show and share. And that's my goal for 2020 is to continue to bring you quality people with quality content that you guys can use and utilize in your own lives and be able to control your lives the way you want to. God bless, guys. Thanks again. I wish you the best. Happy 2019. Happy 2020 coming in. Look forward to more shows and what we can do for you. And let's see. I think I have one more question as I'm getting to my end here. Okay. Uh, Jamie, so to be safe and start off with my state, then as I grow bigger to collect everywhere or start collecting everywhere now, this has really been helpful. You said there is a replay. When can we get that? please. That replay will be up within 24 hours. We will have it up. It'll be on YouTube. So go to our YouTube channel and you'll be able to uh, check it out there. Uh, if you don't have the YouTube, YouTube channel, when we send this out, we'll post the link to the YouTube channel. So you'll be able to get it again. Thanks, Jimmy, for being here. I don't want to take up any more of your time. It's already been Thanks well over an hour. Uh, appreciate you being here. Value you as what you do in the bit for the business world and for what you do for sellers. Thanks. And until my next show, guys, God bless and uh, happy new year. Absolutely. Thank you, John.